It's honestly amazing how much better Pokemon Gold and Silver are than Red and Blue. Red and Blue are already pretty fantastic games on their own, and Gold and Silver take just about everything they do and does it bigger and better. Which is really impressive, considering that these are still just regular Game Boy games, even though they are Game Boy Color enhanced. Starting off the game, you get given a starter Pokemon. After Pokemon Yellow, they decided to go back to giving you a choice between three rather than one specific Pokemon. And the choices are, once again, Fire, Water, and Grass. Cyndaquil, Totodile, and Chikorita are the options this time, and unlike the previous set, these guys are monotype for their entire lines, unlike Red and Blue's Charizard and Bulbasaur. These guys are my favorite set of starters out of all the generations of Pokemon, and whenever I play a Johto game, or whenever I play the best Pokemon game, I have trouble deciding which one to go with. This is a lot unlike the Kanto games, where, even though I also love all three, I tend to default to Bulbasaur unless I'm explicitly trying to shake things up. This time I went with Cyndaquil, since, and one of the few annoying things about these games, fire types besides Cyndaquil are either locked to Kanto, require Firestone to evolve, which you can't get until Kanto, or are Magmar. And all my homies hate Magmar. It's not a huge problem, since the Fire Punch TM is easy to get and can be taught to a lot of good non-fire types, but I wanted a fire type this time around, so Cyndaquil was the choice. Actually, the weird availability of Pokémon brings up an interesting thing about these games that makes them different from most later Pokémon games. Gold and Silver are pretty explicitly sequels to Red and Blue. Later games, like Ruby and Sapphire, have pretty much nothing to do with the games that came before, other than being Pokémon games and usually having at least some Pokémon from previous generations. But Gold and Silver have a lot to do with Red and Blue. The plot with Team Rocket is a direct follow-up to Giovanni disbanding the team, the Pokemon selection is heavily mixed, to the point where many new Pokemon are only available in the Kanto section. And that's probably the big one. You go to Kanto after the Pokemon League and get to see what's changed since the original games. I'd even say that these games come close to being an expansion pack to Red and Blue. The only things that really prevent that from being an accurate description is that you play as a new character and you start in Johto. Also, there's no Sonic and Knuckles style lock-on technology to expand the old game even though that would have been the coolest thing ever. And also, would have made trading Pokemon from Red and Blue a lot easier, since in reality you needed two Game Boys and a Link Cable to get your old Pokemon into your new game. The plot is one of the few areas that isn't obviously better than Red and Blue. In fact, it's almost identical. There's three basic plots happening at the same time. There's the Pokemon League plot, which is just as basic as Red and Blue, where you're fighting gym leaders to get to the Elite Form Champion. Then there's the Team Rocket plot, where a few times in the game, Team Rocket attacks a location and you have to beat them up and wipe them out. The Team Rocket plot is also where you get to meet Lance, who later turns up as the champion, when they're messing around in the Lake of Rage. The Rival plot, which interconnects with the Team Rocket plot since he wants to defeat them to prove his strength, is the most complex, since it has to do with character development. For the most part, you randomly run into your rival at points in the game. He challenges you to a battle, and he loses. Then he gets confused and angry and basically calls you a cheater. He slowly comes to the realization that he needs to be friends with his Pokemon, not just treat them like tools for battle. The rival plot is fine, and probably the most interesting of the three. As far as Pokemon rivals go, he's probably one of the best, since he's the most explicitly antagonistic, even starting the game from stealing his Pokemon from Professor Elm. Even after he becomes better, he still doesn't like you. One of the biggest things in this game that nowadays is commonly known as one of the best things about Gold and Silver, but at the time was more of a surprise, is the inclusion of the Kanto region. Kanto is something of a post-game, since the credits do roll after beating the champion, but since it's just as big as Johto and has a lot of Pokemon and NPCs to talk to, it's arguably just the second half of the game. The plot really takes a back seat in Kanto, and depending on how you play it's something of a boss rush too. There's one encounter with a single Team Rocket grunt, and one encounter with the rival. Besides that, it's mostly just a tour to see what's changed since the first game, and a bunch of fights with the gym leaders. Wild Pokemon are basically a non-factor during this segment of the game, since their levels are the same as they were in Red and Blue, and most dungeons have been removed. The gym fights are pretty fun, and having 8 additional gyms is pretty awesome no matter what way you look at it. Blue being the Viridian gym leader is also pretty cool to see. The game really culminates with Mount Silver in the battle with Red, the protagonist of the original games, who apparently has been standing in this cave staring at the wall. 
His party has incredibly high levels, and it's very likely your party will be way lower than his when you first are able to fight him, unless you've been grinding. But, like most battles, you can deal with the level difference by hitting him with super effective moves. The only one of his Pokemon that I had trouble with on this most recent playthrough was his Snorlax, because who uses fighting types? Not me, apparently. But I had a solution. That leads me to talking about the Legendaries. As you might be able to tell from, well, the covers of the games, Legendaries are a bit more important than they were in Red and Blue. But they're still rather optional, though the game does push you toward them a bit harder than Red and Blue. Unlike later games, both cover Legendaries are available in both games. The difference is that the one on the cover of that game is available earlier at level 40, while the opposite Legendary is available later at level 70. To compare these main two legendaries to the legendaries for Red and Blue, the cover one takes the place of the legendary birds, while the opposite one takes the place of Mewtwo. The remaining three legendaries, the legendary beasts Suicune, Entei, and Raikou, are wandering legendaries. They run away when you encounter them, unless you're lucky enough to catch them. I love all three of these guys, but the method to capture them is very annoying and difficult. I think the version difference between the Ho-Oh and Lugia is a cool way to differentiate the versions while still allowing you to get both legendaries. There's also Celebi, which you can't get anymore outside of cheating or playing the 3DS version of Crystal. This is the equivalent of Mew, and there's not much else to say without getting into stats and moves. So now that I've talked about the legendaries, I should probably talk about the rest of the new Pokemon, since those make up more of the game's experience than the legendaries. There's 100 new Pokemon introduced in this generation, bringing the total up to 251. And honestly, that's not many to add. So the game is very reliant on the original Pokemon to help fill up the world. As I've already mentioned, many new Pokemon, such as Houndor, Slugma, and Murkrow are only available in Kanto, which isn't too bad as far as filling up the Pokédex goes, but I, and I'm sure most people playing these games today, would like to have my six-member team decided far before that point, specifically before the Elite Four at least. So they're basically useless to me, except as enemies, even though I would really like to use them. Actually, let's do something and look at the new Pokemon availability in Johto. Let's say I want to play Gold or Silver without using any Kanto Pokemon. First, we eliminate two of the three starter lines, since you can only get one without trading, and I'm going to be assuming a standard playthrough without trading here. Next, we're going to toss all Pokemon that are evolutions of Kanto Pokemon. There's actually 11 of those. Next, the Pokemon that are locked to Kanto are Mount Silver, which is 10 Pokemon, representing 6 lines. We'll also get rid of all but one of the legendaries. Multiple reasons for this. First, I don't like to use them in my runs most of the time, but also because, except for the Coven legendary, they're either difficult or impossible to obtain, so they're limited to effectively the very end of the game. So that's 5 more Pokemon gone. Next, the version exclusives. That's 6 Pokemon that are not in one game or the other. I'm also going to get rid of Tyrogue and Hitmontop. While well, theoretically you can get Tyrogue and evolve him to hit him on top, and that counts as not using a Gen 1 Pokemon, the odds of that happening are pretty low, and they are related to the original Hitmons. And to finish that up, we get rid of the baby Pokemon, which is 6 Pokemon, not counting Tyrogue. So that leaves us with 54 available Pokemon, and since, unless you're doing something weird, you won't usually double up on a single line of Pokemon, leaving us with 34 fully evolved Pokemon to pick from. And that includes Unknown, which there's no reason to use, as well as Pokemon that are available very late in Johto. Obviously, that's not the way you're intended to play, since the Kanto Pokemon are there to use, and the new evolutions are still no new Pokemon to use. But it might make people that like to exclusively use new Pokemon, which I am sometimes one, a bit irritated at the lack of selection. While the availability is rather annoying, I do like pretty much every new Pokemon, except for Magby. Magby, by the way, is one of the baby Pokemon, a concept designed to show off one of this game's new mechanics, breeding. In single player, breeding isn't too useful since the time spent on it could just be time spent on grinding. However, it could be useful if you want multiple of a Pokemon you can only get one of, or if you want a Pokemon with a certain egg move. 
Egg moves are moves that a Pokemon can learn from its parent that it can't learn normally during level up. TMs can also be passed on much like egg moves. Breeding is the only way to get most of the baby Pokemon, so that would be its main use for most people, but it does have some cool in-depth mechanics about passing on stats and stuff, so it can be used to create a perfect Pokemon. However, that's mostly useful for competitive stuff, and I doubt there's many people playing competitive Generation 2 on cartridges in the current day. As far as the other new mechanics this game introduced, the most important by far is the two new types, Dark and Psychic. The rebalanced type chart that was introduced along with these two types would be the type chart for Pokemon all the way until X and Y when the Fairy type was introduced. These new types are pretty clearly intended to counter the Psychic type that was extremely powerful in Generation 1. Dark is immune to Psychic attacks and Steel resists them, in addition, Dark is also a weakness for Psychic types. And as another nerf to Psychic types, Ghost actually is a weakness for Psychic types, fixing an error from the first game. Psychic is still extremely powerful, and I'd still argue that it's the best type in these games, but now you can't destroy everything with just a Psychic type. The biggest thing holding back these two new types is that there aren't many Pokemon or moves for either type, but they still provide a nice check to a previously overpowered type. Besides the new types, the game is mostly mechanically identical to the originals. There are two major differences, though, that affect battles. The first is that the special stat has been split into special attack and special defense. This is a very important change, since it no longer means that special is a disproportionately important stat. In Generation 1, a Pokemon good at special attacking was also good at taking special attacks, while a Pokemon that couldn't special attack would die to them easily. Now special focus Pokemon are balanced a bit more. The second major change is the introduction of held items. Pokemon can now hold items that affect battles. These range from items like berries that can automatically heal status or HP, or items like mystic water and charcoal which boost the attack power of different types of moves. Held items introduce a small additional level of strategy to the game beyond just move selection. Minor changes to the mechanics are mostly what might be considered bug and oversight fixes from the original games. Enemy AI is improved slightly, things like the toxic leech seed combo no longer work, etc. Overall, I'd really say that the mechanics of this game are way better than Red and Blue's. To simplify it way down, the game's battles work like how they were supposed to be in Red and Blue, plus the balance has been improved. On top of mechanical updates, the graphics are obviously better as well. Obviously you'd hope so, since it is a sequel, but it's something I'd like to point out. While the colors are the obvious graphical improvement, the graphical improvement that I really appreciate is the Pokemon back sprites. In Gen 1, the back sprites can be incomprehensible, and appear to be smaller images doubled or quadrupled in size. In Gen 2, however, the back sprites are equally as detailed as the front sprites, and you can actually tell what Pokemon you're using. To me it helps just a tiny bit with the immersion, as I can actually connect that image on the left with the Pokemon I have sent out. And since I'm talking about graphics, shiny Pokemon are something that needs attention called to it. Including incredibly rare alternate color palettes as a feature is a really cool idea they had, and it's something they could only done post Game Boy Color. And having the red Gyarados encounter is great just to make sure the player is aware of the rare color and concept. I won't say that shinies are something that really affects how good the game is, but it is a nice additional feature. Now it would be inappropriate to say that this game is better than Red and Blue without discussing the few games that this game is worse. One thing that makes this game worse than Gen 1 is that the dungeons are nowhere near as complex. The closest thing Gen 2 has to Sulfco, the Radio Tower and Goldenrod Underground encounter with Team Rocket, causes me nowhere near the confusion of Sulfco. In addition, the other dungeons aren't near the complexity of Red and Blues, including the dungeons that are supposedly brought back from those games. Now I will point out that this is a little subjective, and I probably fall more on the side that would say that less complex dungeons are positive, but this is a difference that many people would probably find negative. The other way I would consider this game worse than Gen 1 is the HMs, and unlike the dungeons, I would consider this to be an objectively worse thing rather than a subjectively worse thing. Gen 2 brings back all five HMs from the original, and adds two more, Whirlpool and Waterfall. Both new moves are Water, and both are worse as moves in Surf, which is also an HM. Now I know opinions are a little mixed on HMs, and I'm honestly a little more on the side of liking them. 
I like them because it makes the Pokemon you carry around feel like something you're working with to explore, not just weapons to defend yourself. It's just a little world building that I enjoy. But I don't like having so many HMs, since they are moves that you can't delete from a Pokemon, and having them repeat in types makes it clear exactly how useless they are as moves. My opinions on the HM moves remains identical to how it was in Red and Blue. Surf and Strength are good moves, Fly is tolerable, and everything else is bad. If they had to add a new HM, I could tolerate it if they had added a decent move, like Surf but of a type that isn't already an HM. But they added two water moves that you can't even obtain until after you get Surf. So I have to mark this as a way that it's worse than Gen 1. And those are the only two real reasons that I can think of as to how Gen 2 is worse than Gen 1. There may be other reasons, but those are all going to be very minor, or even more subjective than the reasons I've already brought up. At this point I'd like to compare Gold and Silver to each other. There really isn't much of a difference between the two, besides exclusive Pokemon and the order in which you gain access to the legendaries. Really looking at the exclusives, there's no Pokemon that I really consider a deal breaker. Though I guess I consider Silver's a bit better, since I like Skarmory, Ninetales, and Donphan more than anything in Gold's list. But I like Ho-Oh more than Lugia, and Ho-Oh is on the cover of Gold. So, it's really up in the air. Gen 2 eventually got a third version, Pokemon Crystal, much like how Red and Blue got Pokemon Yellow. However, unlike Yellow, I wouldn't really consider it a different experience or superior to Gold and Silver. It has a lot of minor improvements and lets you play as a girl, and also ties its cover legendary Suicune into the plot a bit more than Gold and Silver did. It also moves around Pokemon a bit, and has its own set of unavailable Pokemon. It's definitely the best Gen 2 game because of very technical reasons, but if you've played Gold or Silver or prefer the availability of Pokemon in those games, it's not really worth playing over them. Its changes are a lot more minor than Yellow's, so I don't think it really warrants its own video like I gave to that. Don't get me wrong, I still do like Crystal, but it really is more like a third version than a unique game of its own, unlike Yellow, which was its own unique experience in my opinion. In comparison to Red, Blue, and Yellow, the Generation 2 games are far, far better. And even in comparison to games that came after, there's a lot more content for a single player playthrough by virtue of it having two regions to explore. While there is still some more archaic and non-intuitive mechanics hanging around, specifically type being the differentiator for physical and special moves, the games as a whole are still great even today, and the biggest, most glaring flaws of Red and Blue were fixed.